Hello, thank you for joining us and welcome to Portland Place, where we will be hosting the first RIBA Economic Panel of 2023. Today, I welcome you from our Council Chamber, which I'm sure has seen many lively discussions about the future of the architect's market over the years. And I hope that today we can add something to that ongoing discussion. I should say that whilst we had hoped for all our panel members to join us in person, today's rail strike has meant that hasn't been possible. Instead, this panel will be split into two uh, sections. In the first, Noble and I will explore some of the economic data we have and what that means and what it might tell us for the future. In the second half, I shall hand over to Helen Castle, the RIBA's Director of Publishing and Learning Content, who will chair the online discussion. You can see the outline agenda for today on your screens. Um, but first, a bit of context. To preface today's event, the Bank of England and the IMF is anticipating the UK to go into a recession in 2023. It's set to be a challenging year for design and construction. Today, we will be exploring what the economic fallout may be for architects and practices and how the potential effects may be lessened. We'll also look at what sectors uh, are declining and which may be more stable and indeed which may grow. With our architects panel, we'll also explore how you might help your business by managing your cost base, securing revenue through good business practice. The RIBA economics panel has been monitoring architects market for over a decade now, bringing together experts to share their experience and understanding, helping members navigate the sector's up to, ups and downs. Today, I'd like to welcome our panel members, Noble, Helen, Fiona, and Chitra. So let me begin by inviting Noble Francis of the Construction Products Association to speak. Noble is Economics Director at the CPA. He's also Honorary Professor at the Bartlett School of Sustainable Construction and one of our longest standing panel members. Welcome, Noble. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, at the CPA, we do forecasts for the UK economy and for 330 different construction sectors and subsectors. What I'd like to do is just give you a few highlights of our latest forecasts for construction that were published on Monday. And it's worth highlighting that as an economic forecaster, what you tend to like is political, social and economic stability. So as you can imagine, the last six months have been quite challenging as a forecaster. But uh, I think it's worth highlighting some of the key points for some of the key construction sectors, just to give you a flavor of what we're thinking will occur in 2023 for the construction industry. So I'll stick to primarily the UK economy overall, and then some of the key construction sectors. But let's start with the UK economy. And what you can see on the chart is UK GDP on a quarterly basis. And that's the black line. You can clearly see the initial lockdown in 2020 with the sharp decline, the sharp recovery afterwards, a slight decline afterwards, where you get the second and third national lockdowns that didn't impact on construction particularly, but they did impact on large parts of the rest of the economy. Then as we get back to the new normal, you see the recovery in UK GDP towards the red dash line, which is pre-pandemic levels of UK GDP. Our forecast is the blue gray line afterwards. And what that shows is that we're going to have recession this year, as Adrian indicated, is in line with the IMF, the Bank of England, and most other UK macroeconomic forecasters. So you end up with quarterly GDP falling um, during the first half of this year, and then recovery afterwards. It's worth pointing out that technically recession is two consecutive quarters of contraction in the UK GDP, even if that's relatively slight. 
So what you will have seen in the newspapers over the last few months are very big headlines of recession, but recession covers a wide variety of outcomes. And what you can see in this chart, quite messy with four different lines on there, but I tried to take the last four different recessions for the UK economy. I put them all indexed to the same point right at the start. And then you can see how deep each of the recessions was and how long it took for each of the last four recessions to get back to pre-recession levels of GDP. The blue-gray line is the recession that we're anticipating. And that's the shortest and the briefest and the shallowest of the recessions. It's worth highlighting that that contrasts sharply with 2008 to 2009 for those of us that were around during the financial crisis. And the financial crisis in terms of UK GDP was five times as large and lasted five times as long as we're anticipating this recession will be. So technically, this is a recession that we'll encounter this year, but it's not as bad and it's not as long. If you go back to the financial crisis, what you notice is that that was very much focused on uh, the financial sector, which struggled to lend you banks going under back in 2008. That's not the situation now. The financial sector, companies generally are in a much better financial position. What we have at the moment is strong demand throughout the economy, but the problem is inflation and cost inflation is coming through, price inflation is coming through all through the economy. And in, it, in addition to that, you have interest rate rises coming through. What we're forecasting is that UK GDP falls 1% uh, this year. And that contrasts sharply with the financial crisis when GDP fell just over 5%. But clearly we're more interested in construction as an industry. And it's worth highlighting the latest construction data, just purely because construction output still remains very strong overall. And what I've done in this chart is highlight the blue gray line, which is total construction output on a monthly basis, and compared that with the pre pandemic levels of construction output. Clearly, construction output struggled very badly during the initial lockdown when there was an enforced shutdown of the economy, uh, but it recovered very quickly. And if you take the latest data for November 2022, construction output is still higher than it was pre-pandemic. So activity is still very strong. And it's still very strong for most construction sectors. What I've done in this chart is highlight some of the key construction sectors on a monthly basis. I've indexed them all to January 2020 pre-pandemic as 100. So you can see how each sector has evolved since the pandemic. And again, the red dashed line represents pre-pandemic levels of output. So you can quite clearly see that private housing repair, maintenance and improvement recovered very quickly, the orange line. Industrial, which is warehouses and factories, is significantly higher than pre-pandemic still. Infrastructure, the blue-gray line, recovered very quickly, driven by major projects and continues to be higher than pre-pandemic. And based upon November 2022's output, private housing is still higher than it was pre-pandemic. That contrasts sharply with commercial and commercial output in November was 27% lower than it was pre-pandemic. But it is worth noting, and I'll return to this point in a couple of minutes when we get into the forecast, the commercial sector depends very heavily on which area you're in. If you're operating in commercial refurbishment, fit out and conversions of commercial existing commercial developments into other types of developments like 
uh, residential and uh, industrial logistics, then commercial refurb is very strong. It's higher than it was pre-pandemic. The reason why commercial output overall is still significantly lower than pre-pandemic is because of the majority of the sector is dominated by commercial towers projects. And whilst there are still a few commercial towers being built, it's clearly not as much as it was pre-pandemic because commercial towers are reliant on high investment up front for a long-term rate of return, multi-hundred million pound projects, particularly when it comes to central London. Okay, so that's the latest data. We're spending quite a bit of time on the forecasts. Now, our forecasts were published on Monday, as I say, and cover 2023 and 2024 for the main construction sectors and also the subsectors, but I'll stick to the main construction sectors. Overall in construction, we're looking at a 4.7% fall. But it is worth highlighting, this is from a point in time when construction activity is higher than it was pre-pandemic. So it's falling from a high point. The total construction output figure isn't particularly helpful, though, because the majority of firms don't do total construction. Firms work in particular sectors, in particular subsectors, and particular regions. So looking at the particular key construction sectors, public housing is ex public housing new build that is, is expected to fall by 10% this year. Looking at the housing associations and local authorities, the vast majority of their activity is likely to be focused towards maintenance of the existing housing stock. That's because firstly, housing associations and local authorities don't want to be caught up in naming and shaming for having quality issues such as mold, uh, which is very high profile at the moment. They also have to address uh, refurbishment because of cladding and other fire safety issues. In addition to that, they also have issues around decarbonisation and the ability to let out those properties from 2025. And this is at a particular point in time where cost inflation is double digit. And so they're having to divert finance from new build over towards uh, improvement of their existing stock. Private housing is expected to fall 11% this year. And we're in a point in time where the house builders have had a very good, strong two years worth of activity, stimulated by uh, race for space, uh, particularly outside London, where areas of key affordability uh, such as the Northwest, such as Yorkshire and Humber and the Midlands, housing has been very strong in terms of demand. That's been exacerbated by uh, stamp duty, help to buy, government policy incentivizing demand as well, enabling that strong demand. The problem is that recently we've had very high increases in interest rates and mortgage rates, which will impact upon affordability. Government policy isn't as favorable, given that help to buy is going to finish in March. And so we're expecting a sharp fall in demand, which was particularly evident after the mini budget when market expectations of interest rates rose very sharply. What we've seen since then is that mortgage approvals have fallen very sharply. That hasn't fed through into property transactions as yet, but that's because this, uh, it tends to take a few months, but we are likely to see that occur at the start of this year. What the major house builders will be hoping is that demand starts to recover from spring as mortgage rates start to fall again. Uh, but if demand doesn't improve from spring onwards, then private housing could potentially fall more than our, our main forecast and over towards what our lowest scenario is. 
It's worth highlighting that in terms of the housing market, the bigger impact is likely to be on property transactions rather than on house prices, because the fall in demand is likely to be also uh, matched by a fall in supply of homes onto the market, given that uh, most people putting their homes onto the market will know that demand is likely to be falling. And so they won't want to put their homes onto the market unless they absolutely have to. So we'll see a sharp fall in property transactions this year of around 20%, but house prices are not likely to fall because you get the fall in demand partly offset by a fall in supply as well. So we're expecting house prices to fall by around 8 to 10% this year, which sounds bad, but annual house prices being 10% per year over the last couple of years. So effectively, house prices get back to where they were last year. And last year, we weren't complaining about house prices. In terms of other key sectors, infrastructure is expected to grow by 2.4%, primarily driven by major projects such as HS2, Hinkley Point C, and the Thames Tideway Tunnel, as well as frameworks in the regulated sectors of roads, rail, energy, water. The key issue there is more about cost inflation. And what that means is that projects currently on the ground will go over budget and potentially over time. It also means there's hesitancy signing up to new projects. And it also means that for local infrastructure, you've got councils who are increasingly having to divert finance away from new build onto ref uh, refurbishment, uh, repair, maintenance and improvement as well. Industrial is expected to grow this year by 2.3%, and that's primarily because of warehouses projects from that long-term shift to online spending, which has driven warehouses growth to unprecedented levels. In addition to that, a lot of manufacturers found that they were capacity constrained in 2021 and so made investment decisions to expand capacity, which came through last year and is coming through this year as well. But it's worth noting that when it comes to next year, we're likely to see industrial drop off. Investment in warehouses has peaked um, and investment in factories expansion uh, has dropped off quite sharply because the majority of manufacturers make their dis investment decisions in autumn for the year ahead. And last autumn was when we had the political and economic chaos and uh, most manufacturers were not able to make big one-off investment decisions for the year ahead. In terms of commercial, we're expecting a 5.4% fall this year, but Again, it's worth highlighting that refurb, fit out, conversions of existing uh, commercial developments into residential and industrial, all those areas remain very strong and are likely to remain strong over the next 12 to 18 months at least. The area that we're expecting to fall away is commercial uh, new towers. There are projects in the system, particularly in London, but if they haven't broken ground already, we're expecting pauses for repricing, given that there's double digit cost inflation there. If they have broken ground, they're likely to continue, but they're likely to go over budget as well. And then the other key area is worth highlighting is private housing repair, maintenance and improvement which doesn't get much coverage in the media, but it is now the third largest construction sector. It reached an all time high in March last year, March 2022, driven by that race for space, people wanting better quality indoor space and outdoor space, in addition to increased working from home, meaning that people wanted better home office facilities. But what we've seen since March last year is that small discretionary spend on improvements works has dropped off considerably. Larger improvements works last year on residential continued because most people had got the planning and allocated the finance at the start of last year. But 
as we see people's real wages falling, as we see interest rates rising, concerns about the economy, we've seen a drop off in planning applications for RMI towards the end of last year, which means larger improvements works on Resi are likely to fall this year. And so that's why we've got a 9% fall in the volume of private housing RMI this year. The one area that remains strong on private housing RMI is energy efficiency. So that's retrofit particularly on insulation, but also solar photovoltaic, which remains very strong and is likely to remain so this year. What I'd like to do is just summarize. It's worth highlighting that construction activity is still very strong, and this isn't 2008. Uh, back in 2008, as I mentioned, the recession in the economy was five times as large as this recession is likely to be. Construction activity back in 2008 fell by 17% because there was a financial crisis, particularly hit house building. This isn't the financial crisis. It's a shallow, brief economic recession where demand is still relatively strong, but people's real wages are being hit, interest rates are rising. So it particularly impacts upon private housing new build demand and private housing repair, maintenance and improvement uh, demand, which is why they're likely to fall sharply this year, but from a high level. There are still some key areas of growth this year, major infrastructure and frameworks activity, which will continue over the next few years, commercial refurb, for grade A quality office space, demand is very high and will be long term. Energy efficiency and solar photovoltaic remain strong. Health construction remains strong as well, both on the public side with 40 new hospitals being built and also on the private clinic side and the research side in biotech. And finally, data centers continues to be a very strong area of activity this year and next year. But there are some key risks out there. Based around the depth and the length of the economic recession, the extent of the housing market slowdown, the availability of labor. It's worth mentioning that some key areas, such as uh, commercial fit out activity, uh, such as infrastructure, engineers and skilled trades are finding that uh, it's difficult for them to find the skills. In construction, we've lost 240,000 people on the contracting side in the last three years. Materials and products cost inflation is a key issue. It's starting to slow in terms of the rate of inflation, but it's still 16%. Uh, per year. That's slower than the 24% in June last year after the energy, oil and commodity price spikes, but prices are still rising for many materials. And then a key worry is what happens to specialist subcontractors? Are we going to see an increase in specialist subcontractor insolvencies as double digit cost inflation combines with a slowdown in activity. But overall, construction demand remains strong. It's just that there are quite a few uncertainties and risks around. So back to you, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Noble. I'm, I'm sure our audience found that most insightful. It provides a, an excellent base of information uh, for practices to think about how they can approach the coming months and years. I'm now going to take the opportunity to go into a little bit more detail about the architect's market and how some of the uh, insights you provided um, relate to uh, what we're seeing um, from the architects. I'm going to base uh, what I'm going to talk about on two main sources of information. That's the RIBA Business Benchmarking Report and the RIBA Future Trends Report. Business Benchmarking Report, thank you for all chartered practices who complete that. That gives us a really detailed uh, set of information about the business of architecture. And the Future Trends Report, which we run monthly, uh, gives us a really good pulse finding of the sentiment among architects, their attitudes towards uh, future work. So 
Let me begin by taking a step back and looking at uh, the total revenue of the architectural market and how that's fared over time. This is the graph you see is the value of work from RIBA chartered practices. And what we saw between 2015 and 2019 is really very strong year on year growth. So over that period, uh, RIBA chartered practices increased their revenue by over a billion pounds uh, to just over 3.6 billion. Uh, what we've seen since then, however, with the pandemic and a degree of economic uncertainty was that big drop in 2020 to 21 and uh, a return of stability, but not growth through our latest findings, which covered uh, up to around May 2022. So we're now in a stable market, but that growth we saw has abated somewhat. Um, where is that revenue coming from? Well, we can look at it in a number of ways, and I want now to look at it by practice size, but I'll also turn uh, to sector a little later. One of the things is that the UK architecture market is uh, diverse. Uh, so we have a number of uh, very large internationally renowned practices, but we also have uh, medium and small practices doing excellent work, uh, primarily at a regional or even a local level. 41% um, of architectural revenue uh, comes from uh, practices with 100 or more employees. And just to give you an idea of the, uh, how that works in terms of distribution, this slide shows the percentage of practices in green and compares that with the percentage of revenue generated in red. And what we can see here is that the large practices, which account for only 3% of the counter practices, account for 55% of revenue. On the other hand, uh, small practices uh, with one to nine staff account for 80% of all REBA chartered practices, but account for 17% uh, uh, of the revenue. So what we have in the architects uh, market is a very disparate market. Uh, and that is reflected also in the sectors, which I'll talk about in a short while. Let us now look to RIBA Future Trends. What we do in RIBA Future Trends is ask practices in the coming three months, do you expect your workload to increase or decrease or stay the same? We deduct the percentage of those who think it will decrease from the percentage we think will increase, and that gives us a balanced figure. We've been running this survey since 2009, so we have before us quite a, quite a good historical data set that shows the journey we've all been along uh, since the Great Recession. Um, what we saw in the financial crisis is a strongly negative uh, sentiment, but slowly we recovered from that uh, to reach a high point of plus 44. Uh, in 2015. What we've seen since then, um, initially with Brexit uncertainty and austerity, uh, was a slow um, but notable trend of deteriorating sentiment. Little uptick with the 29 uh, election uh, when certainty looked to be briefly on the cards. Uh, but then with the COVID lockdown, we saw that rapid deterioration in confidence, but an equally rapid uptick in confidence. And we saw over the last couple of years, a really good recovery in architect sentiment. However, what we've seen over the last few months, uh, accentuated by the political uncertainty of the trust premiership, is uh, deteriorating confidence. Indeed, in November last year, it was at its lowest point, excluding lockdown since the financial crisis. We saw a small uptick in uh, December, but we're still in negative territory. And that negativity is mirrored in on the ground. So practices are reporting their workload is a little below where it was a year ago. And it's worth stressing, as Noble has stressed, that this is shallow. This is not a catastrophic drop. Uh, we've seen a, a, a small uh, drop in workload compared to a year ago. And we've seen a small increase, as you see on the right-hand side, in the percentage of people who are reporting personal underemployment. So we are seeing a dampening of the architect's market. 
what does that mean by sector? And uh, drawing on some of the excellent insights uh, Noble shared with us is firstly to note the importance of the housing sector. It accounts for around 38% of architects workload and it's worth bearing in mind that uh, Noble has indicated that that will be among the worst hit sectors, particularly our m and uh, The commercial sector accounts for around a quarter um, with other sectors, health and education, industrial and mixed accounting for the rest. So I think given that um, concentration on the housing sector within the architects market, we can expect um, some dampening. Now, what we can also see is that sectoral distribution is markedly different by practice size. So what you can see here is those sectors I've described in the previous slide broken down by practice size. And you can see that housing accounts for 69% of work for small practices. Indeed, housing extensions and conversions and alterations make up almost two thirds of the work of a single person practice. So that downturn in uh, housing and housing rm and I is likely to be particularly felt by smaller practices. As practices become larger, what this graph shows us is that practices tend to take on a more uh, divergent range of work. So health and education, and perhaps we'll see growth in, in the health sector, industrial and transport, and mixed and other. There we see the larger practices having a more diverse range of work types. And, and often that diversity uh, it well equips you for a changing market. Um, I should say that we can also look at the attitude uh, architects have towards future work by sector. Sector breakdown is a little different in future trends, but the point remains the same. Private housing has seen a, a really good couple of years. Um, indeed, uh, the attitude towards future work reached an all-time high point in uh, mid-2021 of plus 42. Um, but we've seen that confidence, which was spurred by a race for space, by people improving their home environment, which had become their working environment, uh, driving a lot of small work uh, and a lot of refurbishment. Uh, that has started to tail off. Now, housing, unfortunately, is the, 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 the sector with the lowest level of optimism. On the plus side, um, commercial, which has been a, a most challenged sector, particularly in in, in the retail area has uh, seen uh, some level of stability and is now the most confident sector. And we do hear reports of a, a demand in uh, refurbishment of office space and the need for high quality uh, office space. And of course, all this fits into the RIBA ongoing uh, concern that we refit our built environment uh, for a sustainable future. And we hope to see that work uh, coming through, not only in offices, but in other sectors too. Nevertheless, all sectors are in negative territory, but this isn't a, a catastrophic drop in confidence. It's a, a degree of circumspection uh, about the coming months ahead. Um, very briefly, I'll just talk about uh, the market by region, because something interesting is going on. London is the big uh, area of work, accounts for 54% of uh, REBA practice work is done through London-based practices. It's not necessarily the place of work, um, but the, the, the office location. Um, but what we've seen over the last couple of years is something quite interesting. We had seen year-on-year -year growth in London as a share of the architects market and indeed in absolute terms. But what we saw over the last couple of years is a bit of a shift. So towards uh, practice revenue being more dispersed uh, to the regions. So the percentage of London, which is that red line on top is starting to drop. And indeed the red bar is showing that the regional work is starting to catch up with the amount of London work. And there's something going on there of a, a, a movement away from, and it may be partly driven by that race for space, that move out of London offices 
out of that concentration towards more dispersed working. We're seeing something of a pickup in the region and something, and I, I speak as someone from the Northeast, something of a rebalancing of the UK architectural market. Finally, I just want to end on, on a slightly positive note in terms of um, architects uh, workload index versus um, uh, the uh, rest of the UK. And you can see there that London had that dip, uh, was below the rest of the UK in terms of confidence, had a brief uh, uptick, but is now lower. Finally, 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 uh, I just wanted to compare um, the workload index versus the permanent staffing index. Uh, I think in previous recessions, we saw, particularly in 2008 recession, we saw architects practices shedding staff. I think we're seeing something different this time. The green line shows the workload index and the uh, bluish line shows the permanent staffing index. Indication so far is that practices are seeking to keep their team in place. They need to retain the talent they have um, and a contributing factor to this may be the, the difficulty practices now have in recruiting uh, from EU. Whereas previously you could get on a plane and join a London practice, for example. Now that's much more bureaucratically difficult. So that shallowness of recession is reflected in, in architects looking longer term, seeking to preserve their unique offering through preserving their talent. And that I think is a bit of good news. So uh, with that, I'll now hand over to Helen Castle. Helen is the RIBA Director of uh, Publishing and Learning Content. And uh, she oversees uh, the publishing department at the RIBA, including the RIBA Journal and RIBA Publishing. Um, previously, Helen was uh, editor of Architect Design, and she's got a background in global publishing and writes regularly and lectures internationally. So with that, uh, let me hand over to Helen. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Noble, for your excellent contribution. Yes, thank you very much, um, Adrian and Noble, for those presentations that were jam-packed with so many invaluable insights. Um, before this event even took place at the speaker briefing, our panel speakers from practice were jumping on those forecasting nuggets, particularly into the performance of the different sectors. As Adrian captured in that very spiky graph for us, the business of architecture has had a very bumpy ride since the Bre Brexit referendum of June 2016, with COVID also in the mix. It's led to some plummeting lows and some small spikes of recovery. To flourish, business requires stability and a consist consistent economic and political context. So how has all this uncertainty played out in practice, what now is the business view of the year to come? I'll be posing these questions to three very experienced leaders from practice, Sasha Barvan, Fiona Clark, and Chitra Marsh. To give you some background first, I will introduce each of our panel speakers and their practices in turn. So, first of all, Sasha Barvan, who's founding partner of Knox Barvan Architects, whose beautiful and acclaimed buildings you may very well be familiar with from the pages of the Reba Journal. Uh, Knox Barvan Architects is a small practice and they have a team of eight, which is largely based in London, um, but they also have a small studio just outside Bath. Sasha's 30 year career has given her plenty of experience and insight into weathering recessions and economic turbulence. Next, we have Fiona. Fiona Clark is practice director of, of David Miller Architects, which she joined in 2006 after a 20 year career in the textile industry. At DMA, her responsibilities include finance and HR. And as a medium sized practice with a team of four in Liverpool and 20 in London, DMA is a design led practice with a reputation for innovative technology led solutions and modern methods of construction. It's particularly strong in the education, 
housing and workplace work space sectors. And lastly, we have Chitra Marsh, and Chitra is Associate Director at Butchers Architects, and she works, um, Butchers works across residential, urban regeneration, heritage, workplace, education, culture, and hotel and leisure. Um, it has rich cross-sectoral experience in all those sectors. It has offices in Manchester and Leeds, and since the pandemic, it's grown from a staff of 45 to 70. Chitra works in the Manchester Design Studio, predominantly on future high street, towns and levelling up funded regeneration projects. She's committed to championing a sustainable future for the profession by promoting equality, diverse, diversity and inclusion, um, and as well as being the Northwest representative on the Reba National Council, she's a member of the Reba Journal editorial panel and is co-chair of the Reba Northwest equality, diversity and inclusion committee. So first of all, um, we're kind of going to reflect, um, ask my ask panel members just to reflect on those presentations um, from um, Adrian and Noble. So and my first question is going to be uh, to Fiona. Um, how closely does what you're experiencing on the ground align with what Noble and Adrian have told us. Thanks, Helen. Um, I think it's uh, worth pointing out that as a relatively small practice, um, just landing one reasonable size project can actually have a really big impact on, on our outlook. Um, but that aside, um, I would say that we very much echo uh, the, uh, the feedback that we've just had from Adrian and Noble. So um, in terms of the sectors that we're involved with, um, certainly seeing that increased demand in workspace that they described, particularly around co-working um, and refitting existing spaces, uh, with um, the health uh, sort of increased demand, we're seeing a little pocket of, of busy activity around life science that's keeping us busy. Um, with housing, particularly public sector clients and, and RPs, again echoing what the guys explained, uh, we're seeing uh, or hearing clients um, have a more cautious approach to investment in new builds, particularly um, primarily because of the increase in interest rates. Um, having said that, though, um, it's it's uh, there's a, there's a commitment there for those clients to to provide new homes um, given the demand. So we think that they'll probably be taking a bit of a longer view on that. So um, there will be that demand from that. And finally, education, which is important for us, that seems to be fairly steady. But we do believe there's an increase in opportunity coming through in that market as well. So yeah, a bit gloomy, but overall feeling relatively optimistic in our little bubble here at DMA. Thanks, Fiona. I'm now going to um, turn to Chithra with this, exactly the same question, really, uh, reflecting on uh, those presentations. Um, yeah, I, I was nodding a lot to, to what both Adrian and Noble were saying. Uh, we can see, we can definitely see uh, that reflected in us as a medium sized practice. Uh, we have a split between private and public sector work, which I think has helped. Uh, cushion what we've been doing and balancing what we've been doing. Uh, also, the, her, our heritage expertise as well has helped to balance out where we um, balance our efforts, I suppose, in making sure that we are um, bringing in as many projects as possible. And with that, through heritage, that's opened up quite a lot of doors for creative reuse. This is all driven by a focus on sustainability and, and environment. So we've, we've been very busy. We're very lucky in the fact that we can spread it across uh, private and public sector projects. Um, the, the, the problem really, I suppose, for us is um, being busy, but profit levels are lower. Um, we, it, there's a battle to keep up with inflation um, you know that 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 goes across the projects that we have won previously. And we're doing at fee levels that we agreed previously, but are now having to um, be more creative, I suppose, in the way that we design. 
to uh, match the budgets that are there now as well. So that that's our biggest thing. And then really taking, so there's, I suppose it's three things. It's that spread of sectors, that profitability. And then again, that, um, that reflects on staffing as well. So we really want to look after our staff and, and appreciate what they've been doing. And um, we're looking at inflation rising and how do we match that with being able to afford to give our staff enough of a, a, a pay rise to, to make them stay? So, yeah, we definitely want to protect our staff and keep, keep them with us and retain our talent. But there, there is a balance with having enough money to, to pay them uh, what they're due, really. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheetra, for that and, and kind of really reflecting on that, the profitability and, and the challenges around that with inflation. I'm going to um, turn to you, Sasha, to give us a few insights into your current experience. Um, that was fantastic. I really uh, enjoyed that. It was very helpful to have it so succinctly summarised for us. Um, so we're a small practice and we do a lot of private housework and uh, new and refurb. And we also do local authority, sort of more community hub buildings, you know, cafes and parks, that kind of thing. Um, I think what we found is that it's been very difficult with clients because how how do you say to a client, well, we're not sure whether we can get that product. Uh, it's in short supply because of Brexit and nothing can come in. And we're not sure how much it's going to cost. And we're not sure how much things are going up. And so it really, that's such a big problem. And you feel terrible saying that to clients. You know, we can't say to you, we can say this is the budget, but really it could go up by X. So that's one difficulty. But I think what we've, um, a good thing that's happened is that we've been able to uh, move across sectors because things have happened like um, Southwark uh, opened their doors again to the framework for small and medium sized practices and practices with uh, a kind of a more inclusivity within the practice. And that really opened doors for us because the doors were always shut on us because we were too small, our turnover was too small. And we've got a really beautiful little project come from actually getting on that framework. And it took ages to get on that framework and it was a huge commitment by us. And another couple of commitments we've made as a practice, which are paying off, they are paying dividends, is we, a couple of years ago, we decided we really needed to understand um, carbon calculation for small projects because there's nothing out there really or there wasn't and so we've developed our own carbon calculator and we're talking with architects to Claire and um, other bodies to try and make something that makes sense of it you know when you do your RIBA awards submission what do those numbers mean you know it's it's, it's very difficult so we've been working very hard with that which is um, really helping us and other people. And the other one is MMC. We've been working a lot with um, uh, a company making cassette built projects and um, that's helped a lot, but it's only by thinking, looking ahead and thinking what might come and let's start now to, to address that and try and get into that market, which is why what... Um, Noble and Adrian have been saying is so useful, really. That's great to hear, Sasha, how um, persevering on those frameworks has paid off and um, all that, that work on the carbon calculators and, and really looking ahead beyond the current climate is, is, is working for you. Now, I'm going to um, ask you some individual questions, really um, drawing in, drawing on your expertise in different areas and I'm first of all going to put a question for Chithra um, and it's picking up on that on the point that Adrian made in his presentation about this balancing out um, of 
work in the UK, which for so long was largely or almost totally dominated by London. Um, and now we're starting to see those other regions in the southwest and, and the northwest out, outperforming um, their sort of previous performance. Um, so do you think this is going to lead to a rebalancing of UK architecture and how important for your practice do you think regional knowledge and expertise is? Um, I, I think I should start by saying, although we are based in the Northwest um, and, the, uh, and in Leeds, uh, we, we work nat nationally. So we take a lot of knowledge that we get from um, the work that we do all over the country. But of course, we, we do do a, a fair amount of work in, in the Northwest as well. And I think um, I've always told clients that the train goes both ways. So that it's, you know, just as accessible to use um, Northwest based or, or Northern based um, architects uh, on Southern based project so I'm hoping that's going to be a positive move that actually they'll start they'll be a bit more network as they get more exposure to what we do uh, outside of London um, that they will start to use uh, other a, a broader spectrum of architectural practice um, I think uh, one of the one of the reasons why there's probably a focus on the northwest and probably the northeast and Yorkshire as well is um, it's not just Manchester as a hotspot or Leeds as a hotspot. It's also uh, the, the Northwest is, is very, is large. Uh, and a large portion of work that has sort of come out recently is, is, is backed by government funding, the levelling up funding, which is a lot of the work that um, my team do at Buttress. And um, I think that is what's focusing uh, or bringing people's focus out to the regions. I think it's looking at those projects now, actually, and those budgets are so small, <laughs> they stretch over quite a few projects. Uh, it, it again means that we're gonna have to be very clever in the way that we do it. But hopefully that will, that will then bring more focus to other, as those projects come forward, um, people will have more insight into what's going on around the country. That's, that's great to hear that 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 that's been a kind of driver for some, sure, for some yeah. of that for that some of that activity. And now I'm going to um, pass a, put forward a question for Fiona. Um, DMA has really had a had a very strong um, track record in the innovation on in technology and innovation. Indeed, you were the, one of the first practices at the forefront of the BIM adoption. Um, how important is it for practices to remain ahead of technological changes and what important trends do you see in the coming years? Um, I think just keeping up to date is really important because um, the minute that you start to fall behind then the level of investment that is required um, uh, obviously increases. So uh, for us making sure that we're budgeting for that is really, really critical. Um, uh, alongside the kind of the givens of the, you know, the hardware and the software that you're producing your day-to-day -day information in. The other investment that's really paid off for us is um, uh, cloud-based solutions. So platforms like the common data environment to develop the project information in with our uh, the design team collaborators and clients. Um, also cloud-based systems for finance, um, project cost and time management, things like that. They're all really helping us to be much more efficient, much more streamlined, and obviously that's all helping in terms of you know trying to, to trying to protect those precious margins, um, as Chitra was saying. Um, uh, in terms of um, uh, trends, then I would say we're seeing an increased demand from clients for better information management. And that's really uh, coming from the introduction of the Building Safety um, Act, uh, whereby clients really need to be able to embed in their own systems how they can demonstrate the, uh, the, the golden thread of information. So really seeing that as an increased demand for technology. Um, there's a lot of talk about AI and weird things like design bots, which I don't really profess to understand at all. 
Um, but from our point of view, the, the kind of the R&D focus is much more on the here and now. So it's about finding ways to streamline and make more efficient the things that we do on a, a kind of an everyday basis in our, our core activities. That's great to hear, Fiona, not only how you're innovating internally, but also the demands that you're getting from clients as well, which is which is great to hear. Now, I'm just going to um, turn to Sasha and ask about her experience as a smaller practice, um, but with offices in both London and Bath, how important to your success um, is a national as well as regional presence? Um, well, we've always worked all over the country. Uh, a, a proportion of our work's very local, uh, but we have always worked all over the country. But the Southwest connection is proving uh, very interesting and hopefully uh, will take us somewhere so that's very good we're it's it's our mmc um cassette built uh knowledge that's brought us into that uh area uh where we're looking at low cost housing and um you know there's a real uh i i really agree what was said about the the regional practices coming up because there's a real desire to it, it goes along with um well-being and uh using local people and having a low carbon footprint you know that you're actually using a local product a local firm a local whatever and uh uh i think that that's that's really good for the regions and it's very exciting to be working in in um another area you know that it's very different from london very different pace, very different uh, uh, desires and and expectations. You know, it's it's nice to be reminded of something that's not quite as <laughs> full on, <laughs> and um, and 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 a real desire to do something in a community based way, really, particularly oh. Bristol. Well, it's great to hear about about that experience really is such, such a positive one for you. Um, I'm going to turn to Chithra because you've, you've also got a very a particular niche really as an individual as well where you've done an awful lot of work as an EDI champion. Could you just tell us a little bit what that commitment to EDI, how, how that makes a difference in practice, particularly when you're facing a challenging market? I think it's so important. It's so important to um, making sure that you, you're continually diversifying. Um, for us, it's, it, 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 it does, it's not just in one area, it's both a project perspective and a company environment perspective as well. So projects, you know, w w the game that we're all in is all about people. The sp you know, it's not just the buildings, it's the spaces and it all centres around people. And so that understanding of cultures and uh, your audience, I suppose, the people that you're catering for, uh, the people that you're providing for is really, is really key. And that that is um, EDI, you know, a, a good understanding of, of, of that balance. Also within a company, um, diversifying talent, knowledge, um, especially when we get sort of younger, uh, younger um, students coming in, they come in with so, so many fresh ideas that we probably haven't even thought about. Uh, and those ideas come from their backgrounds, how they grew up, who's influenced them. So I think it's incredibly important. Uh, and for, it's not just for our company on its own, it's for the, it's, it's for the industry as a whole really so to me it's key to being robust as much as it's key to being um having those environmental targets and having um other ma uh, major targets that we've all got to to aim for i think that social target is really important as well um, it makes a whole that's great that's it's very exciting to hear how you're really embracing that that younger diverse talent as well for the future 
And now we're um, under the spotlight with <laughs> that B Corp's accreditation. You know, it, it's really important that we do it right. I'm, I've, we've got really two minutes to finish off. So I'm going to jump to our final question um, because I really want to make sure that our audience get, get your tips really for practice resilience. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to come straight back to Sheetha and ask her for what is her one tip for practice resilience and practice growth in this difficult period um, of recession? So for me, I think it actually it starts with Noble's report. <laughs> it covers everything. I mean, I, I've, I've already asked permission to sort of use that as a basis for our um, our relook. We every year we relook at our business development for each of the sectors and how we um, restructure that and where do we where do we put our focus. So that's about that exercise is about to happen. So for us, I think knowing the market and where it's going is a really good basis. Um, using the using your experts in those sectors as well, uh, because they've got the knowledge, and then working together to form a strategy going forward, and not just for the first year, for the next three years, and then just keep revisiting it every year, and that will help you keep on top of it. And just just being looking forward in the market, I think. That's great. Um, Sasha, what would your tip be that you'd like to, to give to other practices at this time? I'd reiterate everything that Chitra said, but um, I'll keep it short. Uh, small practices, don't panic. Uh, build a war <laughs> chest. Uh, <laughs> Try and do keep some money back because it, it really relaxes you and makes you think, <laughs> well, I can keep going and um, and look to the future. That's wonderful. Fiona, your last uh, I'd on this. I'd echo the point on a really strong financial management so that you are able to weather the storm. I'd couple that with um, uh, keeping everybody in the team informed of where the practice is at because I think people understand that together then um you know having a sort of strong collective solid loyal team of people who are all on the same mission you know that certainly helped us get through and i think if i could add one other top tip i think absolutely keep your clients happy so that when they have that next fantastic opportunity hopefully they think about you first and not somebody else <laughs> so yeah thank you very much fiona and thank you for the whole panel Chithra, Sasha and Fiona for having given us some really constructive pointers to end on and really looking at the future and thinking about um, business management and also communication as well. Um, and thank you, Noble and Adrian, for your invaluable insights and also reassurance um, that it might be a recession, but it's perhaps not as bad as it could be. So thank you, everybody, today. Thank you.